Amen. Well, good morning to you. Really uh, happy to see you here this morning. Um, would you um, spend some time with me praying this morning? Father, um, we uh, cry out to you this morning for your mercy when you um, have spoken in your word of who you are, when you have self-described, you have called yourself a God of mercy. And so, Father, we ask that in your mercy this morning, in your mercy these days, that you would stop this, this virus that has been described as a pandemic. We ask, God, that you would save lives. Father, we ask that in our community that there would be your merciful protection, but we also pray, God, around the world that you would save lives. And I think, Father, um, right now we think of those places that are particularly um, unequipped to deal with this virus. And so many godly missionaries who are out on the field in those places sharing the gospel. And we ask for your protection. We ask for your mercy in those places. And I suppose, God, to some degree, it seems a bit trivial to talk about business. Um, but uh, in relation to life, um, you know, businesses are are nothing, money is nothing, this world system is nothing, but at the same time, Father, uh, many of your people have their lives uh, in this world tied up in businesses that you have seemingly called them to. And this virus could be devastating financially. So we ask for your protection in that way. Father, we pray for uh, President Trump, for uh, other government leaders, international, federal, state, local, to have the wisdom to not be driven by anything other than the desire to serve the people. And we pray that the best courses of action for prevention and care would be, would be shared. Your word also says uh, that we are to number our days aright that we may gain a heart of wisdom. And uh, uh, so Father would ask that in these moments of difficulty and, and sometimes fear as it strikes and kind of hits um, that we would recognize immediately when that fear hits that you are a sovereign God and that if we belong to you if we have repented and put our faith in Jesus Christ that we are on a foundation that cannot be shaken we realize how fragile life is and how real and long eternity is and we pray Father that people would turn to God in this apparently dangerous time. Father, um, thank you for each person that you've brought here today. We uh, are grateful for each one of them. It seems that the desire to 
study your word and be together is stronger than than the fear. And I know that not everybody's acting on fear, God. I know that there are some acting in goodwill and, and trying to do the right thing. And that's what we want, Father. We want to do that as well. So help us to honor you today in our services and calm the hearts of your people. Help us to look at your word and understand. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we uh, are in this kingdom series called The Kingdom because we're preaching through, teaching through the gospel of Matthew and his central focus is the kingdom of God has arrived through the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, he's in the middle of a sermon that is contained in the book of Matthew, that sermon known as the Sermon on the Mount stretches from chapter 5 to chapter 7. So doesn't take too much looking around to see that we are on the last words today, the last words of, of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Um, so we're coming into the end of chapter 7. And, and next week, we'll, well, we'll see what happens next week, but uh, in, in the, the next time we meet together, uh, we will um, finish up uh, chapter 7. You note in your Bible probably there that um, at the end of chapter 7, the, the red stops and the black begins. Um, at chapter 28, or excuse me, verse 28, uh, Matthew adds his commentary, which, by the way, is still the word of God. It, it doesn't change from red to black and not become uh, less or become less important. But, but what he says there in those last couple of verses has to do with the authority of Jesus. So we want to spend... Uh, one of our Sundays talking about why Jesus preached with authority compared to other people. I think that'll be very helpful to us. But today we have Jesus' last words, his conclusion to the sermon uh, on the mount. And and so, um, you know, a a conclusion is a pretty important part of a sermon. Every, Every sermon has parts, and some people think a sermon should be entertaining, and they don't go to church here. But the the thing is that, um, uh, a sermon should not necessarily be entertaining, but it should be understandable. And uh, for a sermon to be understandable, it has to have some components to it. It has to have an introduction. It has to have a body. That body is, needs to be well designed, and then it needs to have a conclusion. And Jesus set his sermon up the very same way. I shouldn't say he set it up. He just did it. He didn't have to prepare. But um, the the conclusion ends up oftentimes being the most important part of the sermon because it's the part we remember, the part that kind of sticks. Uh, I have an old friend, a very dear friend who's been a pastor for a long time. In fact, he baptized my family and I. Um, and he had told me years ago when his daughter was five years old that uh, she had noticed that every time he went up to the pulpit to preach, he'd bow his head for a couple of minutes before he began to preach. And she said, you know, Dad, five years old, she says, Dad, you know, why do you always bow your head before you're going to preach. And he said, because I'm asking God to give me uh, the ability to to share a good sermon. And she said, okay, so why doesn't he do it? (laughs) Um, (laughs) uh, (laughs) Kids can be pretty sobering. Uh, You know, so so while a sermon is is far from the category of entertainment, it does need to be uh, well designed. Some so we're in the conclusion here of, of Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount. Very lengthy sermon, and now he concludes. And when he concludes, it's potent. It is so potent. Uh, so take a look with me, please, uh, as we read through uh, chapter 8, Matthew chapter 7, excuse me, Matthew chapter 7, beginning there at verse 24. Somebody say, I see that? Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house. But it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. 
and the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. So, uh, two people, right? Two men, both heard the words of Jesus, both built a house, both experienced uh, uh, rains, floods, winds. One builder heard the words of Jesus and did something with what he heard. He was uh, seen there by Jesus, by the God of the universe, as wise and having built his foundation as secure, despite the onslaught, his house stood. The other builder also heard the words of Jesus. Isn't that interesting? But he thought it unimportant to do much of anything with it. This was foolish, Jesus says, because when the weather hit, his foundation built on the sand just washed away. And there was a tremendous collapse. Two builders, two foundations, two outcomes. Well, what does the parable mean, and why finish a sermon with this? Well, we need to remember that Judaism had become a religion of hearing a lot of God's word and doing very little with it. Hearing a lot doing very little with God's word. Even the Pharisees, we know, who kept the letter of the law to the smallest degree, weren't really doing God's word because Jesus said what of them? Back in chapter 5 and verse 20, Jesus said, if you do righteousness like they do, you won't even enter the kingdom of God, right? Right? So this Sermon on the Mount gave clear instruction of the differences between strictly keeping the law and actually doing what God's Word says. There's a difference. He's been teaching us. Here's a few examples. Most people can say they've not murdered anyone and they can feel really good about that, but few will say, you know, my heart's not right, it's full of anger. That's one of the things Jesus taught in this sermon. Some people will self-righteously say, you know, I've never committed adultery. But few people will say, you know, my heart's not right with God because it's full of lust. Many people will say, I'm the practitioner of some kind of religion. But few people will go to their closet by themselves, say nothing to anyone, and build a relationship with God alone because they want fellowship with him. Those are the things that Jesus has been talking about. So it's not at all surprising when you look at verse 21, backing up just a little bit, you look at verse 21, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father. He's talking about doing God's will at a heart level. Not everyone. You see that at verse 21? Somebody say, I see that. Then he begins verse 24, our text, with the same word, everyone. See that? Not everyone, but then at verse 24, everyone who hears these words of mine. It's specific, what Jesus is talking about here at verse 24, is is specific to these words of mine, Jesus says. It's specific to that because in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has taken the word of God to the heart level. It's always been that way. We've always been at a place where we should have been seeing it that way, but nobody was. And so Jesus is saying, it's got to get to the heart level or you have nothing. You have nothing. Not everyone who says, but everyone who hears and does. At the heart level. Everyone. By the way, everyone means another thing, doesn't it? It means it's all encompassing, right? Nobody escapes what Jesus is saying here. Regardless of what you believe or say you believe, nobody escapes. Jesus says this covers everybody. Everyone who does what? Notice these words now. 
Everyone who does them or does not do them will be like. See those words? Will be like. So Jesus has begun something here in this part of the text that he's going to do a lot of in the rest of the book of Matthew, the rest of his ministry. And it's called a parable. He's likening one thing to another. He's likening something that everybody understands in normal everyday life to something spiritual that most people don't understand. He puts them together so that we get it. Jesus is the, is the master of that. We often call it a parallel. You know, that parallels that. It's the same kind of thing. It looks the same. Jesus uses the word parable. The word parable means the same thing setting a commonly understood thing alongside a spiritual principle for greater understanding. So Jesus presents three commonly known items in this parable. And what we need to do is determine what those commonly understood items mean spiritually. What does the Bible say those items mean on a spiritual level? And then, then we understand the parable, don't we? So what are they and what do they mean? That's what we're going to dig into. Three generally known items and their spiritual parallels. First one is this. A house is like the soul of a man. A house is like the soul of a man. Again, Jesus mentions two men built, each built a house. In this parable, the, the house is likened to to the soul of a man, or you might know it as the inner man. The soul is the inner man. That's what we just sang about. God, build up my inner man, amen? Build up my soul. Make me something in there. A person is comprised of at least two parts. We don't have to be too bright to figure that out. We know we have a heart inside of us that's physical and it beats and it pumps blood, but we also know we have a heart that stores up things like anger and love and all sorts of things. So it's not really a visible kind of heart, it's a spiritual kind of heart, right? So we have a soul and we have a, a body. There's two parts to us. Jesus said, for example, don't fear those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. He said we're two parts at least. Both body and soul obviously exist. So the soul of a man is like a house. How is the soul of a man like a house? Well, first of all, uh, it's like the soul of a house because it contains all that a man actually is. It contains all that a man actually is. In the world, we have crazy sayings like a man's uh, house is his castle. And what we mean is that everything that he has is kind of contained there. That's his little kingdom. And Jesus says, really, the soul is like that. The soul is everything that you are. You need to understand that's where the emphasis of life should be because that's really who you are. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? The soul is everything. It's all you are. We were reminded again this week in our household that you can't take it with you. Sandy's uh, mother passed away this week, and uh, we were really, really blessed and fortunate to be with her when she passed. But what was amazing to me that, that just always strikes me like a ton of bricks is that you can accumulate vast wealth and you can accumulate tons of material things. But when you die, it's gone. You cannot, I mean, it's such a stupid phrase, you can't take it with you, we just blow by it like it's nothing, but the fact of the matter is, everything that you've gained materially, physically, is just plain not attached to you anymore. Wherever it is that you go, you go just like you came in. Bare naked, nothing. So the soul is where the investment must lie because it can, 
It contains all that a, a man actually is. But a house is like a soul also because it's built. It is built. Whether wise or foolish, each man built his house. That's what Jesus says. They built. 1 Corinthians 3 tells us each one should be careful how he builds. In fact, at 1 Corinthians 3, it, it, it speaks of the material that we should use. Some last, some doesn't. So you might think of it as an investment in time, treasure, talent. That's what we need to do with our souls. That's how we build them up. We invest. Now you need to understand also, I think, though, that a person might be totally ignorant to biblical truth. Might not know a thing, never cracked a Bible, never been in a church, might not know anything about it, but everything that they do somehow contributes to who that inner man is. Everything that they do is building on that, that inner man. It, they're becoming something by what they do with their life by what they do with their thoughts, by what they do with their time. Matthew chapter 19, a very rich, 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 rich man comes to Jesus, but he's terribly troubled. He has no stability in his life because he's built and he's built and he's built and he's built, but his soul is unstable. John chapter 4, you have a woman who comes to Jesus, and she's had one relationship after another. That's how she's built. That's, that's what she's plugged into her soul. She thought that was going to give her stability and found there was none. She had nothing. So a soul is built, and we either build on rock or we build on sand. There's either stability or none at all. Either way, a soul is being built. And that means that we're responsible. It's like a house because it's responsible. It, a house is like a soul because it's responsible. In the end, in our story, Jesus' parable, each was held accountable and received its due recompense for the way it was built, right? Right? One house stood and one house fell. Just as the houses were responsible, so each man is responsible for the condition of his soul. He's responsible for how he builds. It's appointed for a man to die once and then judgment. When we die, we don't disappear into nothingness. We're responsible for the condition of our soul. This, by the way, is called the doctrine of the competency of the soul. The competency of the soul. It speaks of the accountability of each individual person before God. So God is absolutely sovereign in election. We know this. We know God's word says so. Even though God is absolutely sovereign in election, every individual has adequate general revelation so that they are able to pursue greater salvific revelation should they desire it. <coughs> so what does it mean that we're responsible well, it certainly means that uh, one's family relationships, church membership, some kind of religious authorities, <coughs> none of that has any effect on the responsibility of the individual. In other words, watch now. Nobody stands before God and says it was their fault. Everybody individually stands there. Everybody individually is responsible. Every soul is responsible. So the house was responsible, so the soul is responsible. And uh, that's a great responsibility because the soul is eternal. The soul is eternal. So you have two houses in Jesus' parable that are unlike 
any physical house in that both houses represented in the parable last forever. One house stood and the other fell, but neither house vanishes from the scene. Do you notice that? Neither house is obliterated. Both continue, whether they're fallen or they stand, they both continue. Turn in your Bible over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter 5 gives us great insight into this. Here Paul says, uh, For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to, be put, uh, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. <clears throat> he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So as Jesus puts it elsewhere, some go to eternal punishment, some the righteous to eternal life. So the house, that is the soul, continues eternally. The soul is eternal. A house is like the soul of a man because it contains all that a man actually is, because it's built, because it's responsible, and because it is eternal. A house is like the soul of a man. And a storm is like the judgment of God. A storm is like the judgment of God. Back in our text, you'll notice there in chapter 7 that the rain fell and the floods came and the wind blew. Both men, right? Both houses. Yes? The rain fell, the Floods came and the winds blew. The storm is God's judgment, both temporal and final. There's a little bit of a difference in this element in the parable uh, to other things, other elements of the parable. It's different in this way. A storm, the weather, actually is God's judgment and not just a picture of it. In other words, when you go to Genesis chapter 6, you see what? You see that uh, Noah experienced a flood. The world experienced a worldwide flood that came by God's hand. It was his judgment. It was his judgment. You go further into the Old Testament and you find that uh, rain was withheld in Elijah's time for three and a half years. God did that. Jonah was, uh, experienced a scorching east wind. It was judgment. We shouldn't overlook the darkness at the crucifixion. And we should also consider the fact that many of Revelation's judgments are weather related. God controls the weather. Did God control the flood situation that we had here last year? Yes, he did. Matthew chapter 5, verse 45 He makes his son rise on the evil and on the good, he sends rain on the just and on the unjust. God either sends weather or withholds weather. It's always in his hands. It would be ridiculous to assume otherwise. God is absolutely sovereign and in control. Remember that when uh, Jesus calmed the storm, so much has been made of that. We'll talk about that in a few weeks. When Jesus calmed the storm, the disciples marveled, saying what? They said, what sort of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? Even they observed that the weather submits to God. God determines the weather. So in our parable, in what way is a storm likened to God's judgment? Well, first of all, 
Notice that it is inevitable. It is inevitable. In our text, it simply says the rain fell and the floods came. <laughs> you cannot stop the weather. We look at the TV guide to decide what channel we want to change it to. We look at the weather to find out how we're going to change our plans. We cannot change the weather. You can't stop the weather. You cannot stop Judgment Day. You cannot stop it. You can't stop it by not believing in it. You can't stop it by having another theory about things. You can't stop it by scoffing or believing something else or believing you're too intelligent to buy into all of this. It doesn't stop it. God's judgment is what? Inevitable. It's a curious thing, though. Because when the Bible describes Judgment Day, oftentimes the way that the Bible describes it in terms of the people on earth is that it's a surprise. It comes like a thief. Like, I didn't know that was going to happen. It, it comes while people are saying peace and security, the Bible says. It, people are shocked when it happens. Here, here's what Jesus said. Jesus says, uh, as were the days of Noah, so it will be with the coming of Christ. For in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying, unaware until the flood came and it swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. And yet we know that Noah stood on that ark for 120 years and preached repentance. And they were surprised when it happened. So despite all these warnings, people will be surprised when Judgment Day arrives. How is that? It's like a guy that I uh, had in a church that I served previously years and years ago. He smoked two or three packs of cigarettes a day. I can't remember how many. But he did it so for 30 years. I remember him saying that. And every time he picked up a pack, it said on the side of it, what? Warning, this is going to kill you, right? Every time he picked up a pack, how many times was that? But guess what? I was there when he got the diagnosis that he had lung cancer, and he looked at me and he said, how could this happen to me? Despite all of the warnings, many people will be surprised when Judgment Day arrives. The judgment of God is inevitable. A storm is like God's judgment because it's inevitable. A storm is also like God's judgment because it is overpowering. It is overpowering. Just as we cannot withstand the power of a storm, we cannot withstand the power of God's judgment. The weather stands as a testimony to our utter helplessness weakness before almighty god it's interesting with all of the technology that we have in the world we have not been able to adequately control the weather so that disasters don't happen haven't been able to do it we're entirely at god's mercy when devastating storms come and the Bible says what? Humble yourself under God's mighty hand. That's the lesson in that. So as we are helpless and overpowered by the weather, we're helpless and entirely overpowered by God's judgment. So the point is this. Whatever strength we believe we have, whatever pride we believe we have, whatever unbelief we think we have a right to have, Whatever argument we might have, it's really of no consequence on Judgment Day. None. I was reading a, an amazing uh, short article from the lead national correspondent for CBS News. And he spoke about his journey to Tennessee where all the tornadoes have taken place there in Cookville, Tennessee. He spent several days there, and he commented then on what will haunt him in the days to come after being there. He said, I'll never forget, there was a resilience that seemed to bond them together, which was inspiring to me. Every single person I talked to mentioned God was in this. I'll never forget Eric, he said, one man that I interviewed. Eric said, how are we here? How do you explain this? 
How do you explain that every single piece of my home is gone and I'm still here? Nearly every person mentioned God, the correspondent recalled. So powerful, nothing a person can do to save themselves. Sound like anything to you? Sounds like judgment. That's the way it will be at judgment. Nothing you can do to save yourself. But only throw yourself on the mercy of God. A house is like the soul of a man. A storm is like the judgment of God. It's inevitable. It's overpowering. And third, the foundation of a house is like the word of God. The foundation of a house is like the word of God. <clears throat> Please look again to our text. Here's the central point of Jesus' parable. Verse 24 Everyone there then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house. And it fell, and great was the fall of it. Again, we see those words, uh, that word everyone. We see it in verse 24. We see it in verse 26. Everyone. So what you have there are two guarantees. Somebody say guarantees. Everyone, Jesus says, who hears these words of mine and does them or does not do them, everyone, everyone. Two guarantees, one house will fall, one will stand, guaranteed, guaranteed. Do you see it? Notice some crucial facts now. First of all, notice that both men heard the word of God. Both men heard the words of Jesus, amen. Amen. Now, we need to understand that hearing is good. Hearing is good. Say that with me. Hearing is good. Do you know why? You can't be saved apart from hearing. That's really what God's Word says. Everybody wants to figure out their own way to be saved, but you can't be saved apart from hearing the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing, Romans 10, 17. Hearing the Word of Christ. In fact, Jesus went so far as to say, Blessed are your ears because you've heard. Blessed means what? Saved. So hearing is good. But how many of you know that there's more than one way to hear? No? Do you know there's more than one way to hear? Do you know that right now in our little group that people are hearing in two different ways? A few years ago, a man confined to a wheelchair somehow became stuck in the grill of a semi-truck. His, his wheelchair handles on the back of his wheelchair became stuck in the grill of a truck. I don't know how, but that happened. And the truck driver pulled out of the truck stop onto the interstate with the man in the wheelchair stuck to the front of his truck. He was unable to see the man in his wheelchair with the handles now firmly in the grill of his truck. Couldn't see. So as the driver proceeded down the interstate, people yelled and blinked their lights and honked and screamed. Ten miles later, he pulled off to see what all the excitement was about. Amazingly, the man in the wheelchair was unharmed after being pushed down the interstate at speeds apparently up to 55 miles an hour. Unharmed, I think, means physically. I'm not sure <laughs> about his, his, his mental ability after that. But uh, <laughs> when the driver was asked, watch this now, when the driver was asked why he didn't see or hear people frantically trying to get him to stop, he said, yes, I heard them, but people are crazy, so I didn't really pay attention. In our parable, both men heard the words of Jesus, but only one really heard. 
One man heard and didn't really care to repent and believe in what he heard. Something else took precedence. Listen to me carefully. Something else took precedence. So he didn't really hear. He heard, he was there, but something else was taking precedence. Now Matthew 13 explains exactly what those things can be. We have a parable there called the parable of the sower. We're not going to go into it, but let me give you three possibilities real quick. Why did one guy here not really do anything with it that was significant? Why? Three possibilities. One, one is that he didn't really try to understand, and so Satan was, it was easy for Satan to come along and quickly snatch it away because he didn't really try to understand. That's what Jesus says in Matthew 13. When somebody doesn't try to understand, instead what they do is suppress the truth, they, they push it away, it's easy for Satan to take that away so that the person sitting there actually physically hearing the word of God doesn't really get it because the God of this world is able to blind the minds of that unbeliever so that they don't see the gospel of the glory of Christ because really they didn't try. That's one possibility. Another possibility is that uh, he was hard-hearted. That's another possibility from Matthew 13. He was hard-hearted so that when he, he heard the word of God and he said, yeah, I want this, but as soon as trouble or persecution came, opposition to the word of God, in other words, for some people it's maybe going home, you get the opposition at home, or maybe for some people you go to work and you get the opposition. Wherever it was that he went, he received opposition to what he just heard, and he just decided, it's not worth it, I'll take the wider, easier way. I'll say I'm saved because I heard the word, and I'm not going to fight it, I'm not going to stick with it, I'm not going to walk in it. So he didn't do. See it? And then there's a third possibility Jesus mentions at Matthew 13. Uh, this is a, called a thorny heart. In other words, a plant grows up, but there's thorns that cover it up, choke it out. This is a person who's filled with the cares of the world and the desire for their own kingdom. So they're so filled when they're hearing the word of God, they're not really hearing because they're so filled with desire and thoughts about other things and can't wait to get to this, can't wait to get to that, that it just chokes out the word of God and, and the hearing of it is just not all that important. Uh, gotta, gotta sleep, gotta do whatever it is and the hearing of it doesn't save. There's no doing. <clears throat> whatever the reason, this man was exceedingly foolish, Jesus says, because he squandered the exceptional opportunity that he had. Every time we hear the word of God, we have an exceptional opportunity. Regardless of the delivery of it, we have a, a great opportunity to receive and something good can happen. But we can be very foolish with that opportunity. Therefore, he says, this is like a, a foolish man who built his house on the sand. That's all there was left. There wasn't a foundation other than sand. And <clears throat> you note there in our text that Jesus is sure to tell us that the man ends up, watch that now, note that, mark that, he ends up with a great fall at judgment. Megas pitsos. It's interesting the words that Jesus uses there, you know what they usually are used for? Usually when somebody conquers a fortress, when, a, when an army conquers a fortress like Jericho and it falls with a great crash that's the word that he uses there great was the fall of it now you have to ask yourself why such a great fall why such a great fall and here's why building uh, excuse me hearing hearing builds responsibility did you hear me hearing does what Builds responsibility. Remember that we showed that the soul is responsible. That was universal, wasn't it? Every soul is responsible before God at judgment. Amen. Amen. Keep trying. Amen. 
getting better, all right, all right. So listen, every soul is responsible, but the more you hear God's word, the more responsible you are. No, I mean, what I'm saying is the more you're there, not really getting it into your heart, but hearing it, just the more accountable to God you are. It, a man who has been told that he has HIV and then goes out and infects people is now charged with murder. But a man who goes out and infects people and doesn't know he has HIV is not charged with murder. Jesus said the very same thing is true of God's word. The righteous judge knows how much you've been exposed to God's word. He knows where you were sitting. He knows what you heard. Turn over to Luke chapter 12 with me for just a minute. Luke chapter 12, we have uh, a great passage that will be very helpful. Luke 12 there, look at uh, verse 47 with me. Very simple. Luke 12, 47, and the servant who knew his master's will but did not get ready or act according to his will, will receive a severe beating. But the one who did not know and did what deserved a beating will receive a light beating. Everyone to whom much was given of him, much will be required. And from him to whom they entrust much, they will demand much more. Now, what Paul says about that over in Romans is that because of your hard and impenitent, impenitent I have trouble with that word, impenitent heart, uh, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. So both men heard the words of Jesus, but only one really heard. Amen. Therefore, you have some guarantees. And Jesus gives those guarantees again. You have these guarantees at Matthew 8. Um, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be found foolish on that day. Are you seeing that? That's one guarantee, isn't it? They'll be found foolish on the day of judgment. Now the point of that is what? The point of that is that many of those people who are found foolish on the day of judgment were actually considered very wise in this world. That, oh, you're so wise to ignore that foolishness, that, that preaching, that Bible, that, oh, you're so foolish, uh, so, so, excuse me, so wise to do that. So they're called wise now, but nothing could be more foolish than having heard the Word of God, 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 warning, 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 and get there and say, oh, this is real. Another guarantee is whatever secure foundation he believed he had turned out to be sand. On judgment. And the last guarantee that I see there is this because he heard and had opportunity to do it and yet didn't, he's going to suffer great fall at judgment. So then there's another man yet, though, isn't there? Real quickly, watch this. The one who heard and did what Jesus said. The proof that we have really heard what Jesus said is that we really do what Jesus says. From the heart. Remember, this is not an external righteousness like that of the Pharisees. That's not what this is. We're not whitewashed tombs that are just looking good on the outside and begrudgingly adhering to the letter of the law. That's not what we're doing here. This is doing what Jesus says at a heart level. This is a, a God creating a brand new person where the old is gone and the new has come. There's an internal change brought about by the Word of God that is powered by the Holy Spirit of God. It's illustrated for us by Peter. Jesus asks a very important question, who do you say that I am? Peter speaks up, says, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus' reply to that is that no man could have figured that out on his own. No man could have put that into Peter's heart. Only God could have supernaturally done that work in him. 
And so Jesus concludes, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Well, that's the very same thing that Jesus says in our text. On this, I will build my church on this rock. On one person after another coming to saving faith in Christ, building their foundation on the rock. The person who hears and does what Jesus teaches is a person to whom God has revealed his son. That man's soul has been founded on the rock and hell shall not prevail against him. You won't fall into hell at judgment. That's what it means to be born again, hearing and doing the word of God. It affects judgment. You see in our text, and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. By the way, the rock, the rock figuratively is used of Christ in 1 Corinthians 10.4, Romans 9.33, 1 Peter 2.8. Christ himself is that rock. Therefore, you have some guarantees. Some guarantees for this man as well. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them, first of all, first guarantee is on the immovable foundation, the rock of Jesus Christ and his perfect word. Listen to me for a moment. We need to learn to stand on God's word. We need to learn to stand on God's word. Not on our own wisdom, not on our, you know, getting somebody to feel sorry for you, not on, we need to learn to stand on God's word. Do you know that he has a firm foundation for you? Do you, do you understand that, that he has a firm foundation for you? It's not a shaky place, it's not a place where you need something from someone else. It is a firm foundation for you, the competency of the soul, you Another guarantee is that they'll suffer no judgment as Christ took the wrath of God, the judgment of God on the cross. And then notice the guarantee that they'll be found wise. Listen, at judgment day, should you build your house on the rock, you'll be found wise on judgment day. And you might very well be found foolish in this world. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. So we stand on God's own word. We stand on that foundation. So judgment has no effect on us. Turn with me as we close today to Psalm 40, if you would please, back to the Old Testament, about the center of your Bible in Psalm chapter 40. Very fitting for our, our church and our world today. <laughs> Psalm 40, follow along with me. Somebody say, I will. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. So what do you see first of all? Someone crying out to God, amen? Second, uh, verse 2, he drew me up from the pit of destruction. Out of the miry bog... And he set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Oh, <laughs> Friends, um, when we really hear, really hear and do from the heart the Word of God, life gets solid. I live in the wisdom and, uh, of God, and my steps become secure. I know what I'm doing 
The world may be confused, but I am not. (laughs) My language, notice, my language is new. Did you see that? My language is new. It's transformed from cursing to praising God. And those around me do what? They see that. There's no mistaking the born-again believer. No, they see it. And you know what? They fear. You know why? That's why they're mean to you. They fear because judgment is standing right in front of them. Now we're kind, we love, we care, but the change in us means something real has happened. And it causes fear. But I no longer fear, I stand on the rock. I stand on His rock. I stand on the Word of God and there's no judgment on that day a house listen let's look at it again look at your outline number one a house is like the soul of a man it's all that he has Uh, it is responsible and it is eternal a storm is like the judgment of God it is inevitable and it is overpowering but the foundation of a house is like the word of God Those who hear God's word and do it build a solid foundation and will be left standing at the judgment of Almighty God. Now, friends, for some of us, that means repentance. It means the foolishness of repentance that I really do need to turn from my sin, that I have neglected the hearing of the word of God that I have had my mind on other things that so much has been excusable in my life that's inexcusable before God listen to me I do not know what will happen with coronavirus I do not know but what I do know is that I'm standing on the rock And I would like very much for you to be doing the same. No panic. No fear. Standing on the rock of God's word. I know who I am. I know in whom I've believed. I know that I'm secure. I know what I'm doing. I will not fear, though the earth give way. Father in heaven, God, thank you for your amazing word. Um, You, in your word, do have the power, Father, to break through and cause repentance and belief in the hearts of people. We ask that you would do that. And as we've called out to you already, Father, we ask that there would be those who would risk it all, the foolishness of trusting you. They would turn from sin and look to you alone for salvation. God, thank you that you have given us a solid rock. Thank you for Christ and the gift of the cross. Thank you for forgiveness of sin and life everlasting. We praise you, gracious God, today, and we are in your hands. In Jesus' name, amen.